Uh, Parker Smith, Guitar Shed Atlanta, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Chris. Appreciate it. All right, man. So uh, first of all, kind of the way I've been starting all these is just talking to people and um, talking about how you got started. Like, how did you start playing? How old were you? How did that happen? Yeah, so I'd, I'd been asking for a guitar as long as I can remember. And uh, my mom finally caved when I was about 10 years old. And uh, she thought, you know, I asked for several toys and instruments as I was a kid. But um, so I got one then and I kind of just was really frustrated teaching myself for a couple of years and um, and then got some private teachers and really started getting serious when I was like 15. Um, that's mm-hmm. when like the practicing took off like several hours a day and playing in high school bands. Um, and uh, and we had a lot of talented musicians around Atlanta a lot of us kind of met through like the all state jazz community. Um, so like we would try it out for all state and stuff and, and formed our own little bands from that. Um, and then, uh, after that, I, I wanted to go to school for music and, and that led me to university of Miami. Um, so they, they had a really good music business program still do. And that's kind of what drew me down there. So. That's cool, man. So when you're starting going back to like the very beginning, yeah. Um, do you remember why you wanted to play the guitar? I mean, obviously, I feel like you don't even need a reason because it's just cool. But like, was there a yeah. specific driver? Like, was there a specific album you had? Somebody you saw on TV? Like, what was the? Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know, thinking way back, um, I remember just a couple kids like would bring guitars into school, which seems crazy. But like, some kids would like bring a guitar guitar in for show and tell in like elementary school. And I just like freaked out. There was like a magnetism that, that was like pulling me towards the instrument. Um, but in terms of like earliest influences, um, the Allman Brothers band were like they were like the big thing. Um, I have I have an older brother and I have two half brothers that are a little older than me, and and they kind of got me into the Allman Brothers. And um, you know, being from Georgia and a guitarist, you know, it's kind of like uh, you know instant connection so i saw that's one of the things is i was kind of just getting to know you online a little bit that i saw that you guys are doing on your facebook page um is highlighting other like right for this month you're highlighting um musicians black musicians from georgia yep. um it's such a rich that was such such a rich history but it's such a cool thing that you're doing i thought Thanks. like talking talking just about musicians is that something you generally do a lot on your social stuff or um yeah i mean we try and kind of um just talking about other people i thought that was a, a departure from what you see on most of the when you creep on most of the uh, right <laughs> music schools it's more like uh it's february special you know what i mean yeah usually a lot of a lot of self-promotion stuff but you know i think at the end of the day all of our teachers like we're all fans you know and um and even like during the pandemic stuff like we've been sharing music with each other like stuff that we've come out with as artists or stuff that we're listening to and and we've done a couple of those like Brady Bunch type videos where everybody's in boxes um, I saw one from Christmas that looked really cool um, thanks. I was jamming along to it before I forget the name <laughs> of the song um, it was Donny Hathaway um, and uh, this is called like This Christmas um, and no uh, it wasn't a Christmas song it was like a Oh, there's another one that we did, which was um, uh, "Don't Change Horses" by Tower of Power. Yes, yes, yeah. I was loving it. Thanks, <laughs> it was man. Awesome. Yeah, we've got a we've got a talented group, and those those projects have been super fun. And we've, you know, those are just for fun for us. And how we've, how you do know. you do that? Do you did you do that on Zoom, or do you does you do you record like one side at a time and then send it along? How did you guys do that? Well, it, it kind of evolved. So for the Tower of Power one, that was the first one we did, and. Um, what we did is we kind of like recorded all the the audio and video and then we kind of just mixed everything together at the end like the audio and the video all at the same time and then we learned from that and that process was pretty difficult so um the next time around we we all recorded audio tracks and then sent them to our piano teacher chris and he just got all the audio together got that synced up really good and um and then we did the video afterwards. So that's oh, cool. to work a lot better. And some people like re-record their video to like mime it or whatever. But um, that was that was huge. And, you know, because it's like sometimes when you have people playing along with the track, it's like the time isn't always 
right there and you know we just wanted everything to be synced well so yeah i know it came off really well it's really cool thanks man um going back to the, like the beginning like do you remember what guitar uh your mom bought you yeah i do it was a uh, a mitchell acoustic it was just kind of like a very beginner i think they're still around mitchell um you know probably like a 200 hundred dollar acoustic guitar i got it for hanukkah and i remember mm-hmm. opening the case and i I didn't think it was a guitar. Like I saw just like the the neck portion. I thought it was like a trombone. <laughs> I was like, oh, because the case must have been like a, a trapezoid kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it was like uh, or the box, it, whatever. Yeah, the box exactly. Um, and and then I like saw his guitar and just like totally freaked out. And it came with a, a little book that um, you know, I I can't remember the method book. I don't I don't really think it's made anymore but yeah some method book that came with it so gotcha so you're doing that and you're doing that for a couple of years on your own what kinds of stuff are you trying to figure out like what's uh what what is you know what would you say 10 yeah so i was 10 um 10 year old parker yeah man so i you know I, I tried to start reading stuff in the book so i i'd already played clarinet since like third grade um and uh was kind of doing that so i could read a little bit and I was trying to transfer some of that information to guitar, um, not very successfully. And um, and then, you know, I think I gradually just got into like where I, I gave up the book stuff and I was like, I want to learn some chords. And then, you know, started learning like your your, your strumming songs, your Van Morrison, you know, Brown Eyed Girl, that kind of stuff. Redemption yep. Song was one of the yep. first songs I learned. Um, so, and uh and yeah, and that's where the guitar teachers kind of helped out too. Um, you know, I had I had a couple guitar teachers. They weren't that memorable early on, um, but then, like I said, once I got a little more serious around fifteen, then that's when like my my first real teacher was. So. Did you have a couple because you were like, ah, this isn't really doing it for me, or did you have a couple because so and so like went to college or whatever? I th- yeah, I think I just didn't really connect. Um, so you teacher. said you said to your mom or something like, "Hey man, this isn't. Let's get somebody else or whatever." I th- I think so. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to remember way back then, but um, I think that's kind of what happened. But uh, you know, that's that was, pretty uh, cool for a you know, twelve, thirteen year old, whatever, how old you were to be like, "Yeah, this isn't working out. Let's find some." Like I don't know if that's actually what happened. Like that, I would have just continued to do those lessons and not enjoyed them forever. Right. And, you know, I think that's a good skill. Yeah. I think that's lost on a lot of students is like we have, you know, several different teachers here at Guitar Shed and like, you know, you might not have the right fit on the first teacher you have. And like, yeah, we have plenty of of hopping around and and that's encouraged, too. So um, and sometimes just like a personality thing, you know, it's like do you guys vibe and 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 their teaching style might not work with your learning style, you know, so. So you go to Miami and study. What what's your what's your degree? What are you studying? So it was music business um, was the degree, and and that was kind of um, you know my mom was like you know she wanted me to have some kind of some structure there with the business piece. Um, I think I probably could have been fine just doing performance in hindsight, um, but I I did obviously I'm using a lot of the business stuff now <laughs> um, as being a, a business owner. Um, but uh, but yeah, they had a great program, and it it was a pretty good divide of of music and business. Like you could get heavy into the music stuff and still, you know, keep the business stuff going, and, and you could kind of take the music stuff as far as you wanted um, to a certain extent, you know. Um, so I like I really tried to like play with like a lot of the performance guys and and get into those circles. So. How big was the program? Like how many, how, how many in your kind of, I don't know, cohort or whatever you guys called it? Um, the, so the guitarist, and, so I was jazz guitar. There's, you could do classical or jazz. Um, and in the jazz guitar program that year, I think there was maybe five or six of us. Oh, okay. So nice, tight group. Yeah. Yeah. The music business program was, was a bit larger. It was probably I'm maybe like 40, 30 or 40 folks. But um, sure. But yeah, the jazz guitar program was was pretty small, and yeah, that's cool. Well, and then that's so probably like twenty kids over the four year program or whatever in the yeah, and some grad students, and yeah, we had some so gra- grad and, students teaching too. 
and are a lot of people like it, this just occurred to me like but what what are what's everybody else's deal like is it is your story like very similar to their stories? Do a lot of people have very different stories? Like, wh- where are they now? Um, in terms of like what those jazz guitar students are doing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, some of those guys, uh, you know, there's some people that are in the program that have like gone into construction and like don't do music anymore. Sure. And there's there's people that are, are still like gigging and like just working musicians. There's people that are, um, you know, that are that are doing a combination of teaching and playing, like I am. Um, I don't know anybody specifically who's like a, you know, a music school owner that off the top of my head. But sure. Um, and then some people have, you know, just from the the program at large, have gone on to be like huge producers and and famous bands and you know all kinds of stuff. That's cool. It just occurred to me because we're in this unique time where, like we probably know what a lot of the people that were around us at that time were doing just because of the nature of social nonsense and LinkedIn and whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool to kind of keep tabs on everybody. And, um, you know, you see like people in magazines, you're like, I know that guy, you know? (laughs) So nice. Yeah. So you get out of school and, uh, I saw that you, uh, you have a, you, you, you write and perform and is that kind of where you were going at that time? Yeah. So, um, so, you know, I graduated 2008, which was when the market crashed. Um, so there w- really wasn't like a music industry, um, a viable position at that time. I had like three internships and they all kind of led nowhere. So I got a little burnout on that. And um, I was like, you know what, I've, I've been teaching. I started teaching when I was like 16, um, guitar and just, you know, cousins or family friends. And, you know, I'd always been teaching even through college. And, um, I just kind of like fell back into that and, um, and started teaching Do, a bunch. Yeah. Yeah. Do what you teaching, uh, is this like handing out flyers, working at somebody else's business, friends and family, word of mouth? Like how did you, who were you, who were you teaching for at this point or who were you teaching? Yeah. So, um, you know, well in high school I was just like teaching like, a, like individual private students. I would go to somebody's house, um, just doing like home calls and then in the summers in college, I would teach at uh, like a rock and roll camp here. It was called Camp Jam. Um, so I did that in the summers. And then it's a good name. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was cool and met a lot of good musicians there. Um, and then after that, after, um, you know, after college, I kind of fell back into uh, some of the Camp Jam stuff and then started teaching out of a couple different studios here in Atlanta. Um, and and then also um, was teaching preschool group music classes in the mornings. So I was just like teaching nonstop. <laughs> like I would, you know, I had three teaching gigs and then I was performing and writing, you know, on top of that. So that's why there's so many um, teachers that I've taught. Well, not so many, but in, in just in starting this, these conversations with people like yourself, like there's a lot of people who when they, they kind of start teaching when they're 20, 21, 22, something like that. They've been playing a long time. And the head shift from being a performer and a student to being a teacher is something that, that people have talked about being difficult uh, and just like a complete change. And I wonder if that was n- not the case for you because you had been kind of like as you were coming into being a performer and a, and as you're a student, you're also teaching at the same time. Yeah, I'd say it was it was less of a shift for me. I mean, I think I always kind of had both of those, you know, in my head at the same time. But there was um, the the preschool music teaching gig was actually really great for me because it it humbled me like a, a bunch, you know. And I was, you know, I'm I'm like coming out of school. I'm like I'm this hot shot guitarist. I've got this fancy music degree and. You know, I can teach all this fancy stuff. And then you go into preschool classroom and those kids couldn't care less about like where you came from, you know, and they demand like, you know, that you're on top of it and they have your attention and and that you're, you know, that you're you're working and you own the classroom. Um, So that was that was really a good experience, just kind of like bringing everything down to like the base level. So. What are some, uh, can you give me an example of 
things going poorly. Yeah, when I would, um, when I would, like, it, it's all about just kind of leaving your ego at the door with preschoolers and engaging, you know, spreading your attention around um, and like energy and all this stuff. So when I would kind of lose focus from that and realize that the class was about them, you know, and I would start doing stuff for me, that's when it got out of control, you know. Um, so just kind of learning how to be present and and really just kind of feed off their energy. That's when the stuff went went really well. Nice. So you're doing that um, and performing as well, I imagine, and and doing other stuff. And and what what's the kind of next step? Like what happens next? Yeah. So um, I I came out with a record um, in like 2011 and um, was doing. I booked my own tours and um, I'd done like two kind of small tours just independently, one by myself and one with the band. Um, and then I kind of just hit a wall with, um, you know, trying to push the, the songwriting, singing stuff. And and then I also um, was kind of getting a little burnout on teaching too, just at, at where I was. I was like, I need to like take my teaching to the next level. Um and then I applied to um, UT Austin for grad school. Um, so I, I started there in like 2014. Okay. Um, and uh, they have a, a great music and human learning is what it's called, their program. But it's just like their music education program. Um, but a lot of it is fo- focused on just like the brain and, and you know, a lot of neuroscience That's stuff. That's a pretty wild um, uh, like – title for the course of study yeah. like human this is how human like this is a class designed f- for humans like to, right to learn how to work like it almost seems like the person who was designing the class was like no you don't get it like this is not uh, teaching this is humans and how they learn like what like what so what was the what was that like like you and you were in atlanta prior to that and you went to to austin yeah so i mean my family's from atlanta i'd I'd moved back here and um, was kind of living on my own. And then, um, and then my my wife was my girlfriend at the time. She like totally supported it, and we like just met each other like maybe a year earlier, and and she moved with me out there, and um, yeah, it was great. I mean, the the program like really, it really took my teaching like to to the next level um, in every way, and. Um, and just kind what of specifically can you get, I'm sorry to cut you off, but can you yeah. think of, uh, something specific that you do now or you tell your staff to do that, that, uh, was kind of not just like a tactical thing, but just like, a that really blew your, blew your mind when you started to internalize it? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a ton of things. I, I think learning how to practice, um, was, was a big thing and just like, and, and how like repetition um, plays a role in practicing and like not just practicing say oh I spent like three hours practicing today but you didn't get anything done and make meaningful results um, so I think that was that was a big thing and just realizing that there's like a quality element to practice and it's not always quantity you know um, and then another thing was just like observing lessons like there's because when you're teaching you you it's hard to zoom out right um, cause you're in it and we had all these lesson observations and, and watching myself teach, I was like, man, like that was pretty sobering. Um, so that's something that we do. We're at Guitar Shed and it's been, it's been great for all these Zoom stuff too, is like we're in the middle of doing another round of observa- observations and I'll just tell teachers like, let me, you know, record your meeting, send it to me. I'll, I'll look at it. We'll all talk about it together and yeah. That's so. cool. So it's almost like the the like game day footage that you can all Exactly. Yeah. Just kinda of dissect it and um and you know, see like what's working, what's not working and you know, it's it's pretty pretty helpful. I definitely want to get to the Zoom stuff, but I just wanna fast forward past grad school. Yeah. Is the plan right after that? Um like, okay, I wanna start something. Do you start guitar shed after that? Do you keep do something else like what what happens next yeah good question so um so i started in 2014 in grad school in january which was kind of weird and i was just like eager to get going 
And they were like, they were also like, why are you applying mid semester, um, mid year, you know, to get in? And I had to like kind of push it. Um, and then I also graduated like in a year and a half. So I like kind of fast tracked the program is like a two year program. So I was done by August of 2015. Um, and when I was finishing up the program, I think I had a part of me was like wanted to go the professor route. Um, I didn't really know what I would be teaching at the college level, like whether it was jazz guitar or uh, music education or music business or any of those pots. Um, and then um, and then I just got kind of um, to be honest, I, I talked to some of my teachers like who were professors and they just seemed like they were dealing with a lot of like bureaucracy and BS. <laughs> and, um, and I've always been kind of an entrepreneur just in general. Like that's just, you know, how, how I've, I'm, I tell people like I'm a very bad employee. <laughs> um, but, uh, so then I just got the idea, you know, I, I applied a couple places and nothing was really biting for like PhD programs. Sure. Um, and then I was like, you know what? This is a sign. I need to do my own thing. And and that's when I opened Guitar Shed, like August 2015. So we moved back to Atlanta and opened it immediately. So, Are you still in the same? Was it a shed at that time? And um, is it a shed now? <laughs> it's, a, it's technically not a, a physical shed, but we're in the same space. Um, and Is know, it like a play on words, like the, the concept of like shedding, practicing? Yeah. Is that the idea? Yep, exactly. So I'm, I'm glad you picked up on that. It was also like kind of my code for like, you know, finding the mu the musician musicians who like, you know, know about shedding and stuff. So gotcha. And is that is that who your who your students were at first, or or what is your like who 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 did you start? I guess that's getting getting ahead of it. But like, uh, you started the business. I guess the first question is just like, tell me about that. Um. <laughs> yeah, so it was crazy. It's like. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's totally wild. So I, you know, moved back to Atlanta and um you know, I've got more college loans now. <laughs> so it's like not the brightest idea to start a business. Um and a lot of people thought I was crazy. And people thought I was crazy when I called it Guitar Shed. They were like you should call it like the Parker Smith Music School or something or you know. I was like, "No, I want it to be this. Like guitar is is my my love. That's my thing. That's what got me in this and you know, the shedding has like a double meaning. I like that. I like that it's simple, um, you know, and, and people can kind of, you know, remember it. It's easy to say. Um, so, yeah, so I, I started it and um, I found a space here in Atlanta and um, pitched it to my landlord. And, you know, I found this landlord and she was really willing to like kind of grow with me. Um, and, uh, and I, it was just me in the beginning teaching. I had four students the first week, um, which is crazy. <laughs> um, so it's not so bad. I mean, it's week one of anything. Week one, yeah. Having four clients, that's not bad at all. Yeah. So, um, and then it's just kind of gradually grown, and and now we've got sixteen teachers and over three hundred students, and um, that's so awesome. That's fast forward five years. <laughs> sure, but man, that's fantastic. So yeah. how did you go from that? Like, talk to me about that first year. Like, you so you start with four students. At the end of the first year, you have, I'm sure, dozens anyway. Um, how do you go from having four students to having whatever you had a year later? Yeah, so it was it was really organic. Um, and I, you know, initially it was me teaching guitar and piano, and then I had gotten to a point where I've got pretty basic piano skills. Um, where I needed a piano teacher, just like out of necessity. It's like, I've got some students that need an actual piano teacher here. Um, so that was the first person I hired. He's still here. And um, and then, you know, we both started filling up, and then I hired another teacher um, on guitar. So I had, like, another guitar teacher. And, and then it just kind of kept snowballing until... Um, and you know, all this time I'm doing all of the admin stuff and and teaching and and managing and um, and you know, and it, it's working. Like I still you know was finding that that balance. But then we got to a certain point. I was like, I need you know just an admin person in here for when I'm teaching. So when people walk in the door, it's not like an empty space, right? Sure. 
Um, so then I hired, you know, one of the admin folks and, and then, and we had her for about a year or so. And then I hired another admin, um, office manager and um her name's Michelle and she came from a more musical background like voice and piano and she started out just doing admin stuff and then we've transitioned her over to doing both so she does admin and teaching um I imagine that the people that would apply to work as an admin in a place like yours would probably be like the kinds of people that could transition into other things in music yeah yeah totally so when and i saw that like always kind of knew in the back of my head i was like all right well you know it, if she can teach and then, then this could be a cool opportunity down the line and so is this your first time being a boss like when you when you open up the the place like managing people like when you start to make those hires like was that an easy transition a difficult transition um it it's not the first time so i'd um i'd while i was at miami i'd um I started like a music festival called Swamp Stomp, okay. and uh, and we had that a Good couple name. years. Thanks. Um, <laughs> the name that name wasn't my idea, but um, but that was kind of like my first experience. I guess just kind of managing a bunch of people. Um, it was you know in the grand scheme of things, it wasn't like a huge festival, but we had you know it was just a big party. We had probably like fifteen hundred people one year. Um, it's a big party. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> but that yeah. So that was kind of my previous experience, and then I. have I'd been in, you know, just bands and stuff working with, with people and, and, you know, I guess you could call it managing my own band and just, you know, so that, I think that was like also just learning there, like how to deal with musicians, you know, which are different breed. (laughs) Sure. Um, So, so it sounds like it was pretty smooth. It was. uh, Yeah. Yeah. The, the hardest part for me is the hiring and the firing. You know, I think that's, that's been like the most difficult thing it's um for different reasons but um you and know, talk just, more about that how specifically yeah so i i think the hiring piece is just like you know you can have somebody that looks really good on paper and and gives a really great interview you know but at the end of the day like until they get in and are teaching in your space like it's hard to really tell if that's gonna work out um so it, it it's taken me a while to dial that in and i'm still you know, still working on it. That's like something that's just like always going to be a work in progress. Um, I and imagine then, and like, Oh, I'm sorry. You go ahead. Go, please. No, no, I was, yeah, I was just gonna talk about the firing piece, but <laughs> Oh yeah, no, please tell me. Yeah. Yeah. And then that just, it's just not fun. You know, it's, it's, um, but it, it's always something that it's like a breakup, you know? So it's, it's one of those things where it's like, you probably should have done it months ago <laughs> and your part of you is relieved after it happens, but you still feel bad, you know, and it's like just dealing with all of those emotions and, and, um, you know, it's just, it's not fun, but yeah. I imagine that also like in that kind of a environment, um, unlike a lot of jobs, you have pretty direct, uh, feedback coming cause there's people coming and paying whatever they pay to, to spend an hour with this person. And then, they either don't come back the next week or you hear about something or what, you know what I mean? Like in, in a lot of jobs, somebody goes and sits at a desk and they might not do a great job, but there's not a third party that's directly, uh, related to that. Like, I wonder it, it, when, when things don't work out, is it usually that you're seeing like external factors like coming in and, and essentially like flashing a red light at you saying like, this person isn't working out or is it something else that you're seeing? Yeah, I, well, it's, I think it's a number of things. Um, sometimes it is those external factors where you'll get feedback from multiple students over time, and like, and, and when whatever student leaves, we always kind of like open the door to like, please share any feedback you have, you know. And a lot of times people don't. Um, some people might not be comfortable um, sharing feedback, positive or negative, and um, so sometimes you don't get it, but then. Sometimes you do, and people are like, well, you know, the teaching style wasn't a good fit. So you have to kind of read between the lines sometimes. And then there's also the metric of, like, how many students this person is losing or how many students they're maintaining, you know, so I can I can look at that. Um, and then also just looking at their behavior and, um, and their teaching ability. You know, it's like how 
I, I don't care how good of a musician you are. Like we're all good at this level. You know, if you're in here, like you're a good musician. It's like, are you a good teacher? You know, that's, that's really what it comes down to. Um, so it's, it's kind of all of those things are, are what informs my decision to like, let somebody go. You know. Do you ever feel, um, so I have, I have two, uh, kids and I sometimes find myself saying things and just afterwards, like immediately afterwards, just the thought, just thinking like, man, I am so lame. Like, I wonder if you have that, like, you know what I mean? Like after you're just like, I don't know, it doesn't matter what the thing is, but I, I'm constantly realizing how incredibly not cool I am because uh, of the things I say. I wonder if you have a similar feeling as a business owner, like, yeah, totally, man. I mean, there's there's stuff that I never, never would have thought I'd had to deal with. You know, just like <laughs> I was like, this is what I'm doing right now, and it's like just whether it's um, you know, just like mundane stuff, you know, around the business and um, you know, replacing things and just stuff breaking and like, okay, this is this is what it is. So, <laughs> gotcha. Um, um, but I take great. Been a, you know, oh, a lot go ahead. Of, sorry, yeah. Yeah, I just said I take a lot of pride in that stuff too, and um, but you definitely have those moments. You're like, you know, you wake up, you're like, what? What am I doing? <laughs> or no, it's not even what am I doing. Sorry, that's not what I meant to point out. I just meant like after I've told you know my my son like stop uh, playing with that whatever you're gonna break it, and I'm just like, God, I'm so lame. Like I just meant in the expl like in what I'm actually saying I, f- I feel uh it's turning into a therapy session for me <laughs> yeah no just like you're adulting you know yeah 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 man. yeah adulting it, sucks yeah and it just kind of happens overnight and you know here we yeah. are <laughs> uh talk to me about the last year like what happened um it, w- when did you start to kind of see what was coming like i remember um seeing the i was telling somebody else on this in this project, I remember when they were building the hospital in China, and I saw so they built an entire giant hospital in a week, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, what's happening?" And then Italy shuts down, and then it was like, "What? They shut down?" Do you remember what was kind of going through your mind? The signals that you were seeing about a year ago when this was all starting? Yeah, I think um, so. For me, I mean, you know, we started hearing murmurs of stuff in January, um, early February, around this time. You know, last year I went on a singer-songwriter cruise um, called Kayama, which was a great experience, and I I taught some guitar workshops on there. Um, and and right before we left, um, they like made an announcement. And they were like, "You can't serve your own food on the cruise ship. Like, we'll have to serve you." So that was like the first kind of sign of like something's going on. Um, and then I didn't check my phone for a week, which was amazing. Um, so I just totally unplugged and then I opened my phone and when we get back (laughs) and it's like princess, uh, cruise ship, like quarantine, you know, that people forget about that. That was nuts, you know? And here I am, I just got off a cruise ship. I'm, I'm just glad to be off of it, you know? And, uh, that was kind of when it hit me. So your phone must've been bananas. Yeah. Yeah. It was after a week of that. It was wild, um, but the business like was great, you know. And I, I think, you know, I, I try and get away a little bit each year and just like totally unplug. Uh, but everything was super smooth, and you know, I've got a great staff here. So then, care- uh, then March comes. At, I imagine you guys probably stopped teaching in March sometime, or or things changed in March, or had had what happened kind of as things started progressing in the country. Yeah. So it. Um, so we ha- we have like teacher retreats um, that we do every quarter. So where we'll have our our teachers will all come here and we'll have like it's just like an extended meeting, you know, for like three hours, and we'll just talk about stuff and talk about teaching and then a lot of housekeeping stuff. Um, but I remember distinctly this was like maybe end of February. Um, I remember telling everybody I was like, guys, be prepared to switch to virtual lessons. And um, everybody kind of looked at me like I was crazy, you know, and, and they were like, really? Like, th- that's what we're going to do? I was like, yep. I was like, we got to get ready. 
you know, when if this happens, like I don't want us to be scrambling. We got to get ready for it. Um, and then, and I do. What does remember, that mean? What does that mean operationally? Uh, like, does that mean like, hey, if you guys don't have broadband at home, you got to figure it out. Like, if you don't have a web, like, or, was everybody pretty ready to have some something in their house that they could do something with? Or yeah, yeah, everybody was kind of had stuff, you know, and um, and some people. By now, a lot of people have upgraded their setups, and myself included. Um, but everybody had something that was workable, so you know everybody was prepared to do it. And um, that last week, um, like right before you know the everything shut down, it was like I think March, whatever that Friday was, March twelfth or something. That whole week, we'd seen less and less students come into their lessons. People just kind of canceling. We have a lot of students here that actually work at the CDC. Um, oh wow! Which was great because I would I'd been talking to them. I'm like, what do you think I should do? And and they were they were initially they were like, I don't know. And then um, and that week they were like, you should shut down. I'm like, okay, that's it. Um, and that Friday was our last day. And um, yeah, so. that's wild. <laughs> What's the mix of your, uh, your, your, the students work at the CDC or their parents? Like, who do you have a lot of? What's the mix of adults and kids that you guys have in? Yeah, we've got a, a pretty good mix. Um, early on, it was like kind of, it was almost half and half actually. Um, but now it's probably about um, seventy thirty, I think, kids to adults. Um, sure. And uh, so yeah, the 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 students I'm talking about are adults, but actually some of them have kids that go here too. Sure. So that's a, what a blessing that you had those like canaries coming in. Yeah. So you didn't have to second guess what you were doing. Yeah. And, um, so that, you know, it was, it was a tough decision, but uh, you know, looking back, it was definitely the right one. I remember telling my teachers, you know, to get ready for the long haul and, um, that it might be next May until we get back to lessons. Um, and everybody thought I was crazy then too. And here we are. And right fe- a year later and we're still virtual so yeah i mean you might be right i mean by the time i hope i'm right yeah 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 yeah, yeah. um so, what was that uh had you guys done any virtual stuff before or no absolutely none and i had always kind of um I, i'd for, i'd gotten you know reached out to from people about doing virtual lessons in the past and and always kind of just been like no the in person thing that's like what we really specialize in here like this our space is really unique and you know the the face-to-face interaction is super important like that's that was like really important to just our business model you know and then and then here you know we have to go virtual overnight and our whole business is dependent on it um so it was it was a learning process um what was the what specifically like what what worked what didn't like what were some uh, one thing I've heard from from other people is that the, the, the big thing is like playing together is not something that is conducive with the lag on stuff. Like what what other things have been surprisingly worked really well? Like what has been a challenge? Yeah, I mean, there's you know we could we could spend another hour or two just talking about the the virtual stuff. I think um, you know everybody was concerned about the playing together and still are now. Um, but I, I think, like, once we stopped kind of trying to f- fix that, then the lessons got better. Um, because you just have to adapt and, and find ways that you can interact with each other and maybe not play simultaneously, but, like, you know, have them playing along with a backing track, you know, so you can hear them playing along in real time, have them play with the metronome, have them be more autonomous, um, you know. And, you know, I think that was a big... Uh, learning thing and and then and one thing that we started doing immediately is we started having um weekly zoom meetings like weekly teacher meetings every monday at noon we get together and and that's been amazing it's like we we never had weekly meetings before because everybody's so busy (laughs) and um like i said we had these teacher retreats you know a, a few times a year but that was it and we've kept up these meetings and and just learned a ton from each other on like everybody just sharing, you know, their tactics and like, okay, well, you know, I've got this problem. Does anybody have any ideas? They're like, yeah, try this, you know, or here's this great app or, 
you know, you can do this screen sharing thing, you know. So it was, it was really just kind of like a, you know, a melting pot of everybody's techniques. That's wild. That must have been a real snowball, like especially like once. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's really like it's brought us a lot closer too as teachers. You know, we just like um, we see each other every week. And, you know, I think it has been a blessing. You know, oh, I hadn't even thought ways. about that, that when you're in person, um, all, all your s- instructors probably had different schedules. Some of them are not teaching full time. Like, so if, you know, so-and-so comes in on a Tuesday and some somebody's Thursday through Saturday, they might not ever even see each other. Yep, totally. And yeah, we have teachers that, you know, some teach one day a week, some teach four days a week, you know, and everybody's right. ske- schedules are staggered. And um, so. That's cool. Yeah. Um, I don't want to take up too, too much of your time, but. I have this uh, set of questions that I've been asking everybody at the end, um, and uh, I have a vision that that will have some kind of a mashup of everybody's answers to the questions kind of put up together. Uh, sure. But if you're game, uh, can I ask you a few questions? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. All right. So uh, some of them, feel free to be as brief or as verbose as you want. Um, <laughs> doesn't matter. Um, so what was the first chord you learned on that? Uh, guitar that you got when you were 10 years old oh man I'm trying to think back um it was probably like a partial g chord is what i would imagine just like third fret of the you know first string um yeah either that or like an e minor <laughs> that probably t- that ties right into what you teach in your lessons like when you're working with students like what what is the first chord that you teach them yeah, so um, first chord, um, usually we do start with, for our younger students, we start with partial chords. Um, so we use, um, most of our teachers use like the FJH series. They have this thing called the Young Beginner Guitar Method. Um, and what I mean by partial chords, um, it's just playing like, you know, the bottom three strings of the guitar or three or four strings um, and not playing like the fifth or sixth string. So... Um, that's usually we start with like G, G7, C, and then you can start kind of building some songs from there. Um, so, yeah. That's nice. As an aside, have you seen this thing called a Lug? Um, no, I might have. Can you describe it? It's cool. It's I have one for my son. It's a three-string guitar. Yes. Um, and it's tuned exactly the same as a regular guitar. Um, so it's the same idea. You're playing those partial chords, but, you know, you get the whole it feels like a real thing for them. It's cool. And then you can obviously like take that and bring it into the regular guitar. Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, I think partial chords are huge because it, you can really, it's less overwhelming. And a lot of our students actually like start on ukulele. Like if we have five to seven year olds, a lot of times we'll suggest starting on uke. Um, but you, you really get to hear every string and you know, it, it's just, a, it's a, it's a good starting point. And then people can transition to full chords however fast they can get all the strings ringing clearly, you know. Nice. And there's less frustration in the beginning, I guess. That's cool. Um, what kind of guitar do you advise students to buy? Um, that's a good question. So we have we have just kind of like a list of, of recommended um, instruments on our website just from different retailers. And um, for me, I like students to start an acoustic um, I, I started on acoustic and I'm kind of old fashioned that way. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think size is important too. like, just get, maybe not get a full size acoustic. If you've got a smaller child, you know, they make half size, three quarter size, you know, different instruments, but just getting an acoustic that, that plays well, sounds good. And like the appropriate size, um, are you looking for like specific brands or? No, no, no. Okay. Just like whatever you would tell somebody, like when they're ask if if you're, I'm sure that's a question you get a lot from somebody who's coming in either on their own or for their kid. Um, that's yeah, a perfect answer. Yeah, but I think if if you have an electric at home and like, and you know you don't want to go buy an acoustic guitar, that's fine, you know. But I I think, you know, the, the downside of starting on electric is well, a lot of people say that like your fingers, you know aren't going to maybe develop as much strength initially just because the gauge might be different. Um, but also I, I feel like it can be a little distracting in terms of just like the actual sound, like the, the acoustic is going to be more pure. There's less stuff in the way. 
you can get less distracted by pedals and you know all that stuff so. for sure <laughs> for sure um what is i don't remember if we touched on this when we were talking about you getting started but what's the first song you remember uh playing yeah so i think redemption song was like the first song that yeah i could play riffs you know and i think um you know like yeah i think brown eyed girl was another one i said but a lot of a lot of what i learned was just like riffs and um which was great but i got to a point where people would ask me like what well can you play me a song and and i looked at them i was like i don't know any songs and i've been playing guitar for you know a little while and like i didn't know any songs so that was kind of a, a big aha moment i was like all right i need to like learn some tunes you know yeah for sure so um what is just a couple more of these what is one thing that you tell your students to do that they reliably do not <laughs> tune <laughs> um you know i i think some people are good about it but i, I think are you people will be like yeah i tuned yesterday or i turned you know i tuned a week ago <laughs> or whatever or, or it's still in tune you know so it's like tune every time you pick up your guitar that's that's something they re- reliably don't do <laughs> that's great uh what's something that you tell your students to do that they reliably uh do um that's a good question um something that they reliably do i'm trying to think of like all my students across the board um yeah when 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 i ask them to slow down but um but there's a a caveat so it, it it's one thing if i say like okay chris play that a little slower you might play it like a tad slower or you might even play at the same speed but if i set the tempo then the student will like play at that tempo. So I think, you know, you have to really, um, students are capable of it, but it's just a matter of like setting it for them. So that's kind of wild because within that thing that they do, you were basically saying that the one thing that they don't do is pl- is play at a, at a slow speed. Like right, you're basically- yeah, it's kind of a backhanded <laughs> answer. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> um, what is your go-to song that you teach people who have never played before when you're trying to get them into like lesson one, lesson two, like when you're trying to teach them that they can do this? Yeah, I think um, uh, Last Kiss, Pearl Jam, um, their version of that, do you know that song? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's I like that song because it's, uh, it, it's four chords, the whole song, and there's breaks. There's like drum breaks. So it gives you time to kind of regroup um, and it's a good way to teach strumming patterns because it's just like the basic strumming pattern that's in a ton of songs. Um, so that that's kind of my go-to. I used to teach um, this song Killing the Blues by Robert Plant and Alison Krauss, um, but that's kind of um, it's kind of off the beaten path for a lot of people. Um, I know that record. And I remember when that came out. I was That was awesome. I, I was like, oh, man, this is great. And I've listened to that record a whole lot of times. I don't know the names of any of the songs on it, yeah. How does that go? Can you sing a little, or like hum a little bit of it? Yeah, it's it's um, it's like uh, it's it's like D A G D. Um, I don't want to do the Allison Krauss thing, but um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, but it's it's super slow, which is great, and it's just those those four chords, and um, you know that's what I really liked about it too. It's just like something repetitive that's just like a, a few chords, you know. Nice. So. Um. If you were not a guitar teacher and you had to pick a job outside of music entirely, uh, which uh, job would you attempt? Um, I would open a restaurant. <laughs> what I would kind of op- restaurant? So um, I've already actually kind of thought about this. Would be like my retirement job, <laughs> um, like kind of like a health, healthy food, um, like food truck in like. The Florida Keys would be great. <laughs> Make smoo- good to me. smoothies and bowls and salads and you know that kind of stuff. That's great. And then seven <laughs> p.m. door shuts. You go off on your catamaran. Yeah, or maybe maybe at three p.m. the door shuts. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, last one of these. Uh, which instrument that you do not play would you like to learn how to play? Um. I, it's, I I play a little drums. Uh, I'd like to just be better at drums. I think that would be the main one. Uh, but of like something I've never played before? Or? No, that's fine. That's a okay. great answer. In fact, that's the most common answer. 
Yeah, um, I, figured, I and, figured. And one that I share too. It's just like from guitarists. Who, yeah. Who doesn't want to play drums? Yeah, it's super fun. I mean, we've got a drum set here, and and I'll just bang around on it. Um, but I just I wish I was better. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Um, well, before I let you go, I want to make sure that anybody who's listening to this or watching this, um, if they're like, man, I really want to get in touch, how do they find you? Are you doing students outside of the Atlanta area? Like, basically just talk a little bit about how people can uh, get the full Guitar Shed experience if they want it. Sure. Yeah. So we are um, we are teaching virtually all right now. So we are accepting students outside of the Atlanta area. Um, one of our teachers is actually in Brazil right now. Um, so we, we are kind of, you know, a little spread out. Um, but you can reach us at guitarsheadatl.com. That's our, our website. And that's also our handle for Instagram, Facebook. It's guitarsheadatl. Um, so that's the best way to reach us. And then you can call us, you know, anytime during our, our business hours or email us at uh, lessons at guitarsheadatl.com. So. Nice. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for doing this. It's been really fun talking with people around the country and um, seeing how things are going. And, and uh, it's, I've really had a great time. So thank you.